Chapter 4, entitled, A Being Unique in His Freedom. Pierre Curie, with his dreamer's spirit, is born to an unconventional family on May 15, 1859. Pierre's grandfather turned from traditional medicine to a new system of caring for patients, homeopathy. Not only did the grandfather dare to work with natural elements, plants and animals, to help a patient heal, he risked his reputation by working in the field that was considered women's science. The next generation, Pierre's father, Dr. Eugene Curie, is also a medical doctor with selfless disregard for society rules. Dr. Curie cares for the wounded rebels during the French Revolution of 1848 and survives the gunfire of government troops that shatters his jaw. His medical practice with the wealthy suffers when he continues giving his services to the lower class and accepts a position as medical inspector with an organization for the protection of children. During a cholera epidemic, Dr. Curie visits contaminated areas that other doctors had abandoned. Dr. Curie's wife is the daughter of a wealthy cloth manufacturer. The family fortune, though, is lost due to the revolution of 1848. The Curies have two sons, Jacques and Pierre, who follow the pattern set in this benevolent family. When Pierre is 12, the Parisian Parisians rise up again, and the Curie apartment becomes an emergency clinic for the wounded near the barricades. Pierre and Jacques leave the safety of their home to search the neighborhoods for wounded. Unflinching from the grisly sights, they bring back to their apartment those needing their father's medical care. When the family moves to Sco, a village outside the Par of Paris, Pierre and Jacques enjoy swimming in the rivers and hikes through the countryside. Dr. and Madame Curie recognize Pierre has a different style of learning, and they choose to homeschool their son. Marie later writes of Pierre, <clears throat> His dreamer's spirit would not submit itself to the ordering of the intellectual effort imposed by the school. When Pierre is 14, the Curies hire a tutor for Pierre in math and geometry. Within two years, Pierre matriculates to the Sorbonne. At 18, Pierre has a degree in physics. Pierre does not immediately pursue his doctorate since his family is in need of financial assistance. He takes a position as a physics lab assistant at the Sorbonne and as an assistant in the mineralogy department. Pierre agrees to spend 10 years working in the public education system in place of military service. With a gentle character combined with his intellectual observations, Pierre, 20 years old, he writes in his diary, Oh, what a good time I have passed there in that gracious solitude, so far from the thousand little worrying things that torment me in Paris. No, I do not regret my nights passed in the woods and my solitary days. If I had the time, I would let myself recount all my musings. I would also describe my delicious valley filled with the perfume of aromatic plants. Often in the evening I would start out and ascend again this valley, and I would return with twenty ideas in my head. His joy in solitary days and deep thoughts also leads him to write his introspection and his doubts. Pierre writes, What shall I become? Very rarely have I complete command of myself. Ordinarily, a part of me sleeps. My poor spirit, are you then so weak that you cannot control my body? Oh, my thoughts, you count indeed for very little. It seems to me that my mind gets clumsier every day. Before, I flung myself into scientific or other diversion. Today, they don't hold my interest. I have so many, many things to do, and pride, ambition. Couldn't they at least propel me, or will they let me live like this? I should have the greatest confidence in the power of my imagination to pull myself out of this rut, but I greatly fear that my imagination is dead. 
In the midst of his youth and brilliance, Pierre is struggling with the question all people, renowned or unknown, in any generation, must ask themselves, who am I? Pierre writes, to drink, to sleep, to caress, to kiss, to love, that is to say, to partake of the sweetest things in life, and at the same time not succumb to them. It is necessary while doing all that to keep the anti-natural thoughts to which I'm devoted, dominant, and active on their impossible path in my poor head. One must make life into a dream and make the dream into a reality. Pierre wants to make the traditional social expectations, what he calls the sweetest things in life, of having a home and a wife, not his reality, but a dream. In place of this, what he is dreaming, his anti-natural thoughts, a life of research and science, to make this dream into a reality. He is answering his, who am I, question. These journal entries, when Pierre is 20, coincide with a tragedy for Pierre that he never fully explains. Fifteen years later, he tells Marie, When I was 20, I had a dreadful misfortune. I lost, in terrible circumstance, a childhood friend whom I loved. I haven't the courage to tell you all about it. I was very guilty. I had and will always have a great remorse about it. I went through days and nights with a fixed idea and experienced a sort of delight in torturing myself. Then I vowed to lead a priest's ex existence. I promised myself to be interested only in things after that and never again to think of either myself or of mankind. Since the tragedy, I have often asked if this renunciation of life was not simply a trick I used against myself to acquire the right to forget. A parallel to Marie's earlier years, Pierre and Marie turn from an event of sadness to science. Pierre and Jacques succeed in making for themselves a world of research. Their time of romping in the woods and exploring nature is bringing results. Having observed Earth's example of symmetry, flowers, snowflakes, or the human body, the symmetry in crystals captures their attention. Over the next few years, they publish nine papers on the study of crystals. The brothers know that certain kinds of crystals placed in a fire will attract, like a magnet, wood and ash to their surface. At the same time, the famous physicist, Lord Calvin has shown that when certain crystals are heated, they generate electricity. This has become a popular phenomena known as pyroelectricity, which means electricity from fire. The brothers study to see if pyroelectricity applies to all crystals. The brothers study, oh, sorry, their lab results conclude no. Their interest is to prove that pressure on some crystals has the same effect as heat. Using tools as simple as a jeweler's saw, tinfoil, hardened rubber, rubber, or a vise, they prove yes, some crystals under pressure produce electricity. At this stage, the problem the brothers encounter is not having an instrument to measure the small amounts of electricity being produced under pressure. This leads to Pierre building an instrument he calls an electrometer, which measures tiny amounts of electric charge. Marie will later explain, their experiment led the two young physicists to a great success, the discovery of the hitherto unknown phenomena of piezoelectricity. Several well-known scientists of other nations have made further investigations along this new road opened by Jacques and Pierre Curie. The partnership between the brothers shifts when Jacques marries and takes a position at a university in southern France. They continue their research when Jacques returns during vacations. The papers they write on this subject are the foundation for today's electronics industry to explore more uses for piezoelectricity, such as ultrasound, 
mobile telephones, television tubes, and quartz crystal watches. For military, <clears throat> for military use, it is the beginnings of the development of sonar, detecting enemy submarines, torpedoes, mines, and icebergs. In World War II, the U.S. government will use approximately 50 million quartz crystals for various military purposes. Pierre develops a scientific scale he names the Curie scale and discovers what becomes later named the Curie, Curie's Law. At this time, Pierre has a new position at the School of Industrial Physics and Chemistry in Paris. He is an instructor and he is in charge of a laboratory. Although teaching is a step up from lab, lab assistant, the move is considered a step down from working at the Sorbonne. Pierre doesn't care. He refuses to play the necessary game of politics in order to garner higher, higher appointments. His students benefit from Pierre's self-effacing style and willingness to share whatever knowledge he has. Recalling Pierre's journal entry to make his dream a reality, Pierre is living his dream. And here's an aside about Lord Calvin, who comes into play uh, with the Curies. He's a mathematical physicist and engineer. His research brings the science of physics into the modern era. He is knighted for his work on the Transatlantic Telegraph Project, improving the mariner's compass to be more reliable, and he establishes the correct value of absolute zero. The unit of Kelvin is in his honor. Back to the text. In the next few years, Lord Kelvin takes note of Pierre's work on the effect of his heat on crystals. <clears throat> Kelvin comes to Paris and visits Pierre which I think is an example of Bill Gates showing up to visit <laughs> an up-and-coming computer programmer, right? Later, when Calvin is testing for his own results and he needs to measure the electricity produced, he asks Pierre to send him an electrometer. Calvin writes a thank-you note to Pierre, adding, quote, I have written a note to the Philosophical Magazine making it clear that your work preceded mine, end quote. The summer of Lord Calvin's visit to Pierre is the summer Marie places first in physics and then goes home to Poland. Marie will be returning to the Sorbonne in October to start classes for her second degree in mathematics. It is this year that Marie's professor, Gabriel Lipman, has arranged for the Society of the Encouragement of Natural Indus National Industry to pay Marie to study and chart the magnetic properties of various steels. This is the point where Marie is in need of a lab space to do her work. Marie and Pierre, their commitment to a solo life of research will shift to a duet. They didn't see it coming. The Sklodowska and Curie fathers have parallel themes. Both love the study of science and yet forego the path of research to have positions with sufficient pay to support their families. Both are nonconformists in the realm of religion and do not belong to the Catholic Church. And while Dr. Curie studied the inoculation for tuberculosis, Professor Sklodowski understood the impact of this disease on a personal level. Both families share the trait of closeness between siblings and with their parents. Their compassion is not confined to the circle of their family. Daring to stand up to government oppression, they have lived through revolutions and continue to stay outspoken. And here's a quote by Marie that she later writes, <clears throat> I have lived under the regime of oppression. You have not. You don't understand your own good fortune in living in a free country. Back to the text. Aside from the similarities of families, Pierre and Marie share the heartbreak that comes with losing a loved one. Both come out of the experience with a monk-like commitment to continue their life of science, swearing off the possibility of ever again being in love. <clears throat> so, there are two Polish visitors in Paris, Professor Kowalski and his wife. The wife knows Marie. 
They met when Marie was a governess for the Z's. Professor Kowalski, aware of Marie's search for lab space, knows a scientist who might be able to help. The Kowalskis invite Marie to a small gathering, a chance to meet this scientist. Whether a matchmaker plot or the interest of pure science, we'll never know. Marie writes later. She says, when I came in, Pierre Curie was standing in the window recess near a door leading to the balcony. He seemed very young to me, although he was then aged 35. I was struck by the expression of his clear gaze and by a slight appearance of carelessness in his lofty stature. His rather slow, reflective words, his simplicity, and his smile at once grave and young inspired confidence. A conversation began began between us and became friendly. Its object with some questions of science upon which I was happy to ask his opinion. End quote. She goes on to add, <clears throat> There was a surprising affinity between his conception of things and mine, despite the fact that we came from different countries, and this was no doubt attributable in part to a certain similarity in the moral attitudes of the families in which we each grew up. End quote. Pierre, though, had written in his journal years earlier. He had said, Women of genius are rare. <clears throat> and now, of course, he realizes he has met a woman of genius. He considers his previous point of view, and then he goes on and he'll write, I'm far away these days from the principles I lived by ten years ago. Marie and Pierre meet again at the French Society of Physics and again at Pierre's laboratory. He has arranged space for Marie to do her work. And Marie writes, he, he was as much and much more than all I had dreamed at the time of our union. He lived on a plane so rare and so elevated that he sometimes seemed to me a being unique in his freedom from all vanity and from the littlenesses that one discovers in oneself and in another. Marie thumbs her nose at convention when she asks Pierre to visit her garret room. This suggestion is unheard of for a proper woman in 1894. Pierre brings Marie a gift. Chocolates? No. Flowers? No. Pierre brings Marie a copy of an article that he has written. And the name of that article is On Symmetry in Physical Phenomena, Symmetry in an Electrical Field and in a Magnetic Field. He has inscribed on the inside of the booklet to Mademoiselle Sklodowska with respect and friendship from the author P. Curie. Marie writes of the visit. Pierre Curie came to see me and showed a simple and sincere sympathy with my student life. <clears throat> On another visit, Pierre brings Marie a book by Emile Zola, Lourdes. Emile Zola, a famous French author, risks his career and prison when he challenges the prejudices and corrupt decisions of the French government during the Dreyfus Affair, and that was 1894 to 1906. Zola's open letter to the Paris newspaper, Je Accuse, is not only the turning point for justice for Captain Alfred Dreyfus, a falsely accused French captain who is a Jew, but an example of the intelligentsia being able to sway public opinion. Pierre has heard students parading down the streets screaming, death to the Jews. Normally quiet in his political opinions, Pierre is horrified that an innocent man has been falsely imprisoned. For the two positivists, Marie and Pierre, Zola's action is exhibit A for the affirmative results of their beliefs. Over the next few months, Marie and Pierre meet for dinner and go for walks. They discuss social justice, religion, and their curiosity of mysticism. All conversations lead back to science, and for them, this means research. Their style of research is disinterest. Marie uses this word repeatedly in several writings. 
in the monetary, oh, so it's disinterest in the monetary value of any scientific work in public industry. Pierre and Marie believe research should be free to push the boundaries of discovery without an economic motive. Pierre, with his single-minded concentration, could be the caricature of the absent-minded professor. Once, too engrossed in the lab work with students, he realizes it is after hours and the building is locked up. Pierre and his students leave the school by climbing out the window and down the gutter pipes. With Marie, Pierre is so captivated in conversation, he misses the last train to Sco, and he walks home. Pierre is not absent-minded about Marie's work as a student. At the end of the term, he is adding up her scores on the mathematics exam to see if she will place first, second, or third in her class. Marie's name is not announced first this time. For her degree in mathematics from the Sorbonne, Marie's name is announced second. With exams over, Marie is returning to Poland. Any attachment to Pierre does not deter her plan. Pierre is distressed at the idea that Marie will not be a part of his life, and he writes to her, But you're coming back in October. Promise me that you will come back. If you stay in Poland, you can't possibly continue your studies. You have no right to abandon science now. And yet Marie feels she has no right to abandon her family and her country. Marie believes it is her duty to be a part of the intellectual movement that will hopefully free Poland. Letters are exchanged through the summer of 1894. Pierre will not relinquish his hope for a life with Marie. In August, he writes to her, Nothing could have given me greater pleasure than to get news of you. The prospect of remaining two months without hearing about you had been extremely disagreeable to me. We have promised each other, haven't we, to be at least great friends? If you will only not change your mind, for there are no promises that are binding. Such things cannot be ordered at will. It would be a fine thing just the same in which I hardly dare believe to pass our lives near each other, hypnotized by our dreams, your patriotic dreams, our humanitarian dream, and our scientific dream. Of all those dreams that last dreams that last is, I believe, the only legitimate one. I mean by this that we are powerless to change the social order, or even if we were not, we should never be sure of our doing more harm than good by retarding some inevitable evolution. From the scientific point of view, on the contrary, we may hope to do something. The ground is solider there, and any discovery that we may make, however small, will remain acquired knowledge. But if you leave France in a year, it would be an all too, altogether too platonic a friendship, that of two creatures who would never see each other again. Wouldn't it be better for you to stay with me? I know that this question angers you and that you don't want to speak of it again, and then, too, I feel so thoroughly unworthy of you from every point of view. Believe me, your devoted Pierre Curie. Pierre wants assurance that Marie will return to Paris and Marie is hesitant to make any commitment. When she is visiting Professor Klowowski and his wife in Switzerland, Marie invites Pierre to come and visit. Rattled with the unexplored emotions of love, Pierre declines for fear of looking too pushy. He regrets his decision and writes, I was on the point of leaving, but then I was attacked by a sort of shame at pursuing you like this against your will. And <clears throat> finally, what decided me to stay was the near certainty that my presence would be disagreeable to your father and would spoil his pleasure in your company. Now that it is too late, I am sorry I did not go. Pierre continues his debate using Marie's future work as leverage. In September 7th, he writes, As you may imagine, your letter worries me. I strongly advise you to come back to Paris in October. It would be a great grief to me if you did not come back this year, but it is not out of a friend's selfishness that I tell you to come back. Only, I believe that you would be better here and can do more solid and useful work. When Marie sends a picture of herself, Pierre has some relief and assurance that Marie will return. 
Pierre refers to this photo of Marie as the good little student, and he will keep it the picture in his wallet the rest of his life. Pierre writes to her, Your picture pleases me enormously. How kind of you to send it to me. I thank you with all my heart. And finally, you are coming back to Paris. That gives great pleasure. I want very much for us to become at least inseparable friends. Don't you agree? Marie is still hesitant to seal her fate with Pierre. She knows that once she is married, a wife's world becomes raising children and running the household. This is not Marie. Marie wants a world of discovery and research, not diapers and recipes. Returning in October, Marie rents a room beside Bronya's medical office. Pierre suggests they share an apartment that he has found. It is divided into two separate units. Marie declines and explains to Pierre that she is planning on returning to Poland at the end of the school year. She encourages Pierre to finish his doctoral thesis. During earlier conversations with Pierre, Marie has proclaimed, quote, Later on, I shall be a teacher in Poland. I shall try to be useful. Poles have no right to abandon their country. End quote. Concerned Marie will follow through with her devotion to Poland, Pierre offers an ultimate sacrifice. Rather than expect Marie to stay in France, he will leave behind his science career and go to Poland. He will find a job teaching French. Will she marry him? Marie still holds back. This offer to leave France and relinquish his research is even more generous considering Pierre's mother is terminally ill with cancer. One evening, Pierre sends Marie a note saying, I'm not coming to see you tonight. My father has rounds to make and I will stay in Sco until tomorrow morning so that Mama won't be alone. I sense that you must be having less and less esteem for me while at the same time my affection for you grows each day. The next step in convincing Marie is he invites her and Bronya to his parents' house. Marie has no need to worry this will be a repeat of the Zorowski's disdain for her. Pierre refers to his parents as exquisite, and they adore Marie. Pierre's mother says to Bronya, There isn't a soul on earth to equal my Pierre. Don't let your sister hesitate. She will be happier with him than anybody. <clears throat> Marie does hesitate. She is, sif she is sifting through her emotions, her commitments to her family and to Poland. Since her past experience of being rebuffed by the Z family, she has come a long way. Pierre had written previously to her, You have no right to abandon science. This is true. She doesn't want to abandon science by becoming married and playing the role of wife. And despite the other reasons of Marie's family and duty to country, what gets Marie up in the morning is science. Marie waits another 10 months. During this time, Pierre finishes his doctoral thesis in March of 1895. Marie and Dr. Curie are in the audience when Pierre presents his dissertation. Marie writes of her admiration for Pierre and says, I remember the simplicity and clarity of the exposition, the esteem indicated by the att attitude of the professors, and the conversation between them and the candidate. It seemed to me that day sheltered the exaltation of human thought. Marie is slowly shifting her reservations of leaving Poland and reversing her resolve to never again be involved. She writes about her change of heart and says, After my return from my vacation, our friendship grew more and more precious to us. Each realized that he or she could find no better life companion. Marie finally answers Pierre, Yes. Writing letters to her family, Marie tells them of her engagement to Pierre. To Kasia, Marie writes about Pierre. Fate has caused us to be deeply attached to each other so that we can't bear the idea of separating. 
The Sklodowsky family, with a long history of rallying around to give love and support, is very happy for their little Manya. Joseph writes Marie, as you are now Madame Curie's fiance, oh, I'm sorry, as you are now Monsieur Curie's fiance, I offer you, first of all, my sincerest good wishes, and may you find with him all the happiness and joy you deserve in my eyes and in the eyes of all who know your excellent heart and character. I would be, <clears throat> I would infinitely rather see you in Paris, happy and contented, than back again in our country, broken by sacrifice of a whole life and victim of a too subtle conception of your duty. A thousand kisses, my dear Manya. Tell him that I welcome him as a future member of our family. <clears throat> and as if that weren't enough, he continues. Joseph addresses Marie's fear of abandoning her family and her country, and he adds, And no just person can reproach you for it. Knowing you, I am convinced you will remain Polish with all your soul, and also that you will never cease to be a part of our family in your heart. And we, too, we will never cease to love you and consider you ours. As the wedding date nears, any loneliness by Marie for her mother's presence is filled by Bronya's mother-in-law, Madame Dluski, who offers to have a wedding dress made for Marie. Marie, who will always be austere, accepts the offer with one condition, and she says, I have no dress except the one I wear every day. If you are going to be kind enough to give me one, please let it be practical and dark so that I can put it on afterwards and go to the laboratory. Marie's father and sister Hella arrive from Poland. Bronia and Casimir attend along with some university friends. Marie and Pierre exchange their wedding vows in a small civil ceremony on July 26, 1895. Dr. and Madame, Madame Curie have the reception in their rose garden. The father of the bride tells the father of the groom, You will have a daughter worthy of affection in Marie. Since she came into the world, she has never caused me pain. Not holding to any tradition for the wedding, it is no surprise that their honeymoon is also unconventional. Marie and Pierre have purchased bicycles and plan on biking along the coast of Brittany <clears throat> and the mountains of Auvergne. Marie will always remember their honeymoon as their, quote, wedding tramp. As an aside, about this time, bicycles are the latest fad and more user-friendly with the new design having both wheels the same size. And then there's a photo in the book of me, Marie and Pierre, and Marie is dressed in a woman's cycling outfit of the day, which are culottes, which are like loose trousers, a waist shirt, and a straw boat hat. Marie has a belt with pockets around her waist, <coughs> which I think is like a fanny pack, and that holds a knife for cutting fruit and cheese, some cash, and a watch. Back to the text. As Marie and Pierre cycle along the roads through villages, their conversation sways from crystals to the, to the foliage in the countryside. And Marie writes, We loved our melancholy coasts of Brittany and the reaches of heather and gorse, which seemed like claws or teeth burying themselves in the water which forever rages at them. End quote. Passing by the older generation onlookers, the provincial villagers are shocked with Marie not wearing full-length skirts. They might have been muttering to themselves, Kids nowadays, what is this world coming to? During their weeks away, the newlywed couple stays with Bronya and Casimir, who are renting a house for a summer vacation. Included in this warm, friendly gathering is Madame Deluska, Hella and Bronya's daughter, Helen. Vladislav, having navigated his family through so many stormy years, is also with them. And that's the end of chapter four. Thank you. <clears throat>